you get a chance, go online. Uh, we converted a video from last night's thing onto YouTube, so you were able to go back and watch it. If you'd like to, we always encourage people to share it because I know the more we can get the word out, the, the ministry out, the more lives and hearts that we could touch. Last night at the end of the service, I think it was 760 or 780 views of the service last night. That's, that's a lot. Can somebody say praise the Lord for that? So if we had 80 or 90 people here last night. I don't know how many we had. I didn't count exactly. But however many people we had last night, plus 760-something people, whatever, plus all the ones that will watch after the fact, plus we have other outlets, plus there are some people that won't click on the feed because they don't want you to know that they're watching, that they watch it without the... <laughs> Those of you that know what I'm talking about, you already know what I'm saying, so you get tickled by that. Praise the Lord. We're going to be looking in our Bibles this morning, Acts chapter 16. And uh, when you find that Acts chapter 16, verse 19 through 31, I want you to stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of God. And uh, we're going to have Sister Tracy is going to come around this morning. I've asked her to read our text this morning. And I uh, sure appreciate her. So while you're finding it, come on around, Sister Tracy. And when our masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them into the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and then magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for the light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Raise your hands to the Lord, and let's have a word of prayer this morning. Brother Eric, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to preach on the inner prison. This is something that the Lord had impressed on my heart to talk about today, on the inner prison. I want us to take a few minutes and just consider the reality of where these two great men of God found themselves at a point in their life. To us, it may not seem fair when we think about the fact that the reality is they were actually doing something good for the kingdom of God. So in our mind, we think it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right that they ended up in this place. But I find that sometimes you can have men or women of God who God takes their tragedy and their testimony that comes out of it to speak to somebody else. And I believe this morning that when we read this story, whatever it was that these two men of God went through, it was for a greater purpose 
than what appears on the surface to just them. Their life would forever be changed. They would have a testimony of the deliverance of God. We were able to see the miraculous through this. Other people were able to experience the miraculous through this. And as Sister Tracy was reading this morning, I didn't pick up on this when I read it myself before. But when she got to the end there of our text, and she read the part where God gave them this deliverance, and it said everyone's bands were loosed. I want you to stop for a minute and consider the fact that the deliverance, the deliverance of God was so amazing, so powerful. It did not just bring deliverance to, to these men of God, Paul and Silas. It did not just bring deliverance to them, but that deliverance reciprocated to the people around them. You see, I believe that we can walk away knowing that when we read this story, that even in our own lives, I've seen this with my own eyes, that God's deliverance was so great for a, a mom or a dad or a child that it reciprocated through the whole family and everybody got the victory through what God did for one person. Is anybody else see what I'm saying? You ever seen that in the past in your time of serving the Lord? But when I look at these two men of God, the last few days I've thought heavily on this, and especially last night and this morning, about the place they were in. And the words inner prison just kind of just kind of stuck with me, kind of hung in there with me. Because they weren't just in any area of the prison. We've preached about it before, but they were in the inner prison. In other words, they were way back in there way down in there where they were at. That part is significant, not just to me, but to you, and it was significant to them in that day. But I began to think about the spiritual contrast to this. I'm going to preach this story out with the Lord's help, but I want us to consider just on the surface the spiritual relevance of this. I've got family members. I've got friends. I've got people that I have preached to. It bothers me to no end, and I mean that in a, in a pure love way. It bothers me to see people that are bound, anybody else. It bothers me to see somebody that are bound with a spiritual chain, emotional, addictive chains, and such as that. It really gets to me, and I'll have to admit to you something. I know that sometimes that there are some things that come to our mind. They don't sound real spiritual. Just go ahead and say amen. There are some ways we feel sometimes and it just may not be real spiritual. And the fact is this morning, there have been times before that I see a family member or a friend or somebody that I have pastored and there's a part of me that I look at where they are. I look at how deep in sin they are. I look about how bound they are and I cannot help but think to myself, are they so far back in sin's prison? Are they so deep down in sin's prison that they cannot get out from where they are? And then on the heels of that, I'm going in this tennis match in my mind. Will they ever get out? Will they ever get help? They are so bound. I don't know. And that flesh part of me says, well, maybe they'll never get help. Maybe they'll never turn to God. They are so bad off in sin. Has anybody besides me ever had those tormenting feelings? I mean, it doesn't sound spiritual. Just shake your head. It don't feel spiritual to think those things. And sometimes you feel guilty for thinking like that. But the truth is, man, we're all human. We understand what I'm saying this morning. If you've ever been in that place, you completely realize what I'm saying. And so I'm thinking, you know, when I read this story about these two men that I believe that it's going to speak to you and me this morning to remind us of our great responsibility to trust God for the greatest kind, the, the greatest way of God's deliverance that is possibly known to man. Because no matter where you're at, no matter how far you've gone, it tells me that God's love is greater still. His delivering hand is still greater than all of that. Can somebody say amen? 
But you see the reality of the place that these men were in, being in this inner prison, those that responsible for putting them in there, they did not want them to easily escape. They didn't want them to be able to just get out easily. Anytime they had somebody that was a high risk or somebody that they were really trying to send a message to. You know, sometimes when they would put people in prison, it wasn't just when they're torment and everything they went through. It wasn't just to show them something. Many times it was to set a public example because back then everything that went on in the judicial system, if you will, it was publicized. Many times, many of the beatings, the hangings and the torture, it was publicized and the greatest reason was to send a message that reverberated throughout their community that said if you try this, this is what you can expect to happen to you. If you do the same thing, you can expect you're going to be hung, you're going to be tortured, you're going to be put in the inner prison. But yet they're sending a message and they don't want them to escape easily. So they put them as far back and as far down in that prison as they could possibly be put. I think about sin's prison and I think this morning about how that the enemy's smart enough to know he wants to put them as far down and as far back this morning as he could possibly put up in hopes that they are not going to easily escape from where they're at. Can you say amen? The other day we were leaving the neighborhood here and it's no secret to most anybody that Gray Street and this area, Keystone on the next road, this is a highly uh, populated area of drug addicts and drug dealers. There's a drug house, two of them that I know of that's within walking distance from this church and they readily have it available and they're always doing drugs. On the weekends, it's a hot a hot spot and it ain't because there's a church here it's because there's a drug hub right around the corner from right here well the other day we were leaving this church and as we began to pull down the road I think sister Miranda was with us and I looked over and there's a lady that used to go to this church there stood her daughter and she had her head inside the car and when she looked up it was as if she was trying to hide her face and I glanced to see who it was because the way she was acting and when I saw her it looked like she had kind of raspberry looking spots all over her face and uh, that is typical of somebody that is heavily addicted and using meth amphetamine that showed me this pure uh, this child who was one time uh, uh, she's a child of somebody that used to go to church here uh, there's somebody that now that, that woman herself is bound by drugs and everything else Sister Nora you know who I'm talking about what I'm talking about and if that don't break your heart man I wonder if you're really saved say amen whether you really got the love of God in your heart and uh, you know the other day I wasn't going to go here but I'm just going to tell this this morning the other day I went to a place a supply house and I got down in there and I got talking to the man that was at the front desk and a guy came over to me and he had a, a McKee or no, a Milwaukee uh, tool set and it was brand new. It was an 18 volt set. Normally would run you probably 280, almost $300. And he walked over to me at one of the counters on the outside and he said to me, he said, uh, would you be interested in buying this set of tools? I said, no, I don't know. I don't have no cash on me, but I was thinking to myself, well, it'd be a pretty good deal if I did have the money. Maybe you could resell it. it never really, <laughs> excuse me, crossed my mind that it might have been stolen. Never really thought about that. A few minutes later, the guy that I normally work with, he's uh, supposed to be another Christian. He came outside and uh, he seemed ir irritated about it. And he said, did that man ask you anything? I said, yes. He asked me if I'd be interested in buying that. He said, how much did he say? I said, $180. He just shook his head in disgust. He said, he does that all the time. And he said, you want to know what's sad? He said, that man right there is very talented. He used to do gutter work and he used to come in here. He's worked for some of the bigger name companies and whatnot. And he said, but now he's addicted to drugs and he steals stuff. And every once in a while, he'll come in here trying to sell things. And he said, it makes me so aggravated. And I said to him, I said, well, I said, my heart breaks for him. I said, because a lot of them, they're so deep down into what they're into that they can't seem to get free. 
you. And I said, I got people I've pastored, I've known uh, that have got family members, and that could be him right now. And he looked at me and he said, Oh, it don't, you know, I, I don't quite agree with you. He said, If they want to get free, they can get free. And his attitude about it, whether some of what he said was even relevant or true, his attitude about it is what struck me. And I thought to myself, Dear God, I hope you don't never battle with some of the things or allow yourself to go down that road uh, because it's a whole lot easier on the outside of the prison to talk about those on the inside and to say what you would do and how you could get free. I met some of them when they are, they're they not on drugs. Uh, there's some good upstanding people. There's some daddy's child, some mama's girl. Hey Amen. Maybe out there prostituting or addicted to drugs and don't know any other way. And I said it last night. I'm going to say it again. We are living in a drug epidemic in the United States. It's sweeping across the globe. And it's worse than most anybody in this room understands. But I can tell you this. That attitude that it had, it stunk as far as I'm concerned. And he said, I don't agree with that. He said, if they really want free, they can get free. I said, you know, sometimes they have to understand where they're at. I said it takes the grace of God and they've got to really, really go after it. I agree. I said, but I have met some that they are so addicted they don't even know how to help themselves or how to get out. I said, have you ever heard of a drug called crocodile? It's all right if I preach like this. I said, you ever heard of a drug called crocodile? He said, no, I haven't. I said, well, they're afraid it's going to come to the United States of America. I said, it's in other countries right now. I said, it eats the body from the inside out by the time you realize that it begins to shut down the nervous system and whatnot. and if I'm not mistaken I think it was like 95% uh, go a rebound rate in other words of everybody that's ever sought intervention and tried to get free from it that there was a 95% chance that they would go back into it and if I'm not mistaken I think that meth is somewhere around 85 to 90% chance that they'll go back into it. Cocaine and that, some of that is 75 to 80% chance that they'll go back into that. Can I tell you, there's a lot of folks this morning uh, that are bound down in the deepest, darkest prison uh, that is known to man, that place of addiction, uh, that place of bondage, that place where they need freedom. Can you say man, somebody until you've looked into the eyes uh, of somebody like I'm talking about, until you've witnessed and tried to help somebody. You can say everything you want. You can have the right attitude or the wrong. But I can tell you, I've been there and I've looked at some of them in the face. I mean, I remember times before I've looked at people in a deep, dark prison. I hadn't long been saved. Uh, me and my wife lived in Okoy, right down the street from the Okoy Church of God. And there was a young girl. I believe her name was Shonda. I think something like that. That right, Sister Myers? Uh, Sister Myers tried to befriend her like she always does uh, and we witnessed to her talked to her she had two little boys uh, and I remember one night she had called us and said you know you believe in God I know you do said I we've got possession or some sort of spirit in our house. Will you come over to our house and pray for our house? We went over there. We anointed the house with oil and the Holy Ghost moved. I could feel that demonic presence. Uh, but you see, Shonda was in a place of her life bound. And it wasn't just that house that needed prayer. Shonda needed prayer. She's the one that really needed deliverance. Uh, shortly after that, she signed up. She called herself trying to provide for her family. And she became a topless dancer in a local place. Uh, amen. We kept on trying to witness to her. I'll never forget one night we had a church service and my wife had invited her to church and she came to church that night. Uh, I've told this story before but she walked over right during the altar service uh, caught my wife completely off guard uh, and she said I've got 
demons in me and I need prayer. We got her down to the altar. We began to pray. And I can tell you that when I looked into the eyes of that person that was deep way down in the inner prison of her life, I can tell you when I looked into her eyes, I saw a hurting soul. And every time she would go in and out, it was a strange thing. But when that possession power would come on her, she would talk in other languages. Her eyes would roll back. But then she would come to herself and you could see the look of desperation in her eyes. Like, please get me out of here. Please give me freedom. You see, this morning, there's a lot of folks that want to be free, but they don't know how to get free. They're not sure how to get free. They may have reached up a time or two, but after a while, they begin to give up. And they say, you know, you look at them and you think to yourself, will they ever get free? How do you think some of them are thinking, will I ever get free? All I ever do is go back. All I ever do is hurt my family. All I ever do is hurt all those around me. And I tell you, just a few years ago, my brother had a young man that was a friend of his. He had been clean for a while. And I tell you, it wasn't but a short, about two years, uh, he had been clean. And one day, he had relapsed and gone back to doing drugs. Uh, it wasn't long he took his own belt off, hung himself outside of another friend's house, uh, and took his life. You know why? Because he couldn't live with himself anymore because he had let himself get so bowed and so far down in that prison. He said, I can't live with myself to put my family or anybody else through it anymore. And he killed himself. Don't tell me this morning it's not serious. Don't tell me it's not a reality. I've been there. I've seen it. I've seen them demon possessed. I've seen them so bound they didn't even know how bound they were. Say amen to me somebody. But you see these two men of God. They were in a place that they put them so deep down in there. They thought that that sadistic punishment would cause them to think I don't want to go back here. If you ever studied historically you would understand this story will take on new relevance. If you've ever heard the story of them being in prison raise your hand. Well, I believe when we're done preaching this morning, we might have a different outlook on Paul and Silas and what these two men went through to get the deliverance that God gave them. You see, historically, that prison that we know of, deep, deep down, dark in there, you would have to go down several hallways and chambers until you finally came to a place that had no windows in it. It was a dark place. If you remember in the scripture, it said in one place that the man had to call for a light. How do you know it was dark? Because one of the guards had to call for a light uh, because it was so dark down in there. I'll tell you this morning, uh, darkness in itself is a tormenting factor. You tell me you are in a place uh, of torment and it's darker than it's ever been. Uh, I'm glad that my God's able to bring light uh, where there was darkness. Can I tell you this morning, uh, there's a lot that are bound in sin this morning. Uh, a lot that are bound in adultery, fornication, thievery, and every kind of sin. But at the end of the day, I said at the end of the day, it's all sin. And you're either saved or you're not. And they were bound in that prison in a dark place where you couldn't see. I can tell you this much. When I studied this prison, no ventilation, no airflow, way down deep in the rock of the prison. Many of these inner prisons look like something carved out of stone. Historically, they say that many died by reason of terror, punishment, and affliction in that place. When they died, they didn't think much about it. They'd unshackle them from their stocks and their chains and they'd drag them off where they would either be buried or just laid out for the vultures to eat as historically proven. Many that were in there went through such gross and sick treatment that nobody wanted to go in the inner prison. Is there anybody here right now that says, Brother Myers, I've known people in some inner, deep, dark, sinful places that I would never want to go. 
I would never want to be where they're at. I've seen what that feels like. I've seen what they've done to their families. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. What they've done to themselves. Say amen, somebody. I'd never want to go down into their historical accounts. Show us that they were commonly placed in wooden stocks. Now, I posted a picture here this morning. Some of you have seen it probably 10 or 15 times or more this morning. But in that picture... It shows a man. This was a historical account of the way that they would strap them down. It was typically the stocks were made of wood. And if you can imagine what maybe two four by fours would look like. They would cut out places where the ankles would pass through. And they would cause the uh, feet and the arms to be what they called distended. And so in other words, they would strap them to these stocks laying on the ground in a deep dark prison, in the inner prison. One leg would be one way, the other would be stretched out the other way. And both arms stretched out and they would be fast in what they call stocks. As I looked at that picture and I began to think to myself what it must have been like. I imagine myself, Sister Farmer, and if I was in a dark place like that in an inner prison, nobody's going to care that I'm there no matter how much I scream, no matter how much I yell, no matter how much I beg for food, no matter how much I beg to get out of there. Nobody cares about where I'm at. And I tell you this morning, sometimes you feel like I don't want to be used. I don't want to be abused. I don't want to be taken advantage of anymore. But is there anybody outside the inner prison that says I still hear you crying and I still love you and I come on now. If that ain't what the church is supposed to do, then you tell me what we're supposed to do. We're still come on now. The Bible said by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one to another. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. But there in that prison, fast in stocks, one leg one way, the other hand, hand and arm the other way, I began to imagine to myself, amen. I don't want to get real graphic, but when a man's got to use the bathroom, he will urinate and defecate all over himself. And then he has to lay there in it. And not just him, but everybody else down there. When I studied in the past, they said there were places in that inner prison that were sometimes uh, several inches deep in just human waste. So when you laid there, they might have laid you in another man's waste or whether another man just died. Come on, somebody, that don't sound pleasant at all. I, come on now. I tell you, some of you don't like rats. Uh, anybody raise your hand? I can't stand the thought of a rat. Uh, I sure don't want one touching me. I'll be doing the boogie dance. Uh, if one tried to get on me, say amen, somebody. But can you imagine being strapped down to the floor, laying in your own human waste, uh, in your own urine, uh, in a place with no ventilation, uh, the very smell that has settled down at the floor uh, has entered into your nostrils and you can't hardly breathe uh, from the emotion you and there you lay with rats chewing on you running all over you roaches crawling on you and you can't do a thing about it and I tell you this morning it wasn't pleasant and it was not pretty can somebody say man, they were down in the inner prison they were down where nobody cared about them say man. I can tell you in that place when you look around you in that condition all hope seems to be lost. Will I ever get out of here? Will I ever get help? Will anybody care enough to get me out of here? All a man can do is sit there, think, pray, talk. And I can see that in the midst of the foul odor, in the midst of rodents and bugs and stank and everything else, all of a sudden, I don't know who decided to start it. I don't know whether they just did it at the same time. And you've heard other preachers preach it, but I want you to listen to me. All of a sudden, one of them breaks out in song. They began to sing praise unto God. And I tell you this morning uh, to other people round about, 
It may not have made any sense, uh, but they're just like the children of Israel. Whenever God delivered the Israelite people, the Bible said their cry came before God for the reason of their affliction. I can tell you this much this morning. Uh, you don't have to know how to get free. Come on now. Somebody say, man, you don't know how, you don't have to know how it's all going to happen. You don't have to know how it's all going to come together or how it all will fall apart. All you got to know is who's in control. All you got to know, uh, sometimes you got to go far enough down that the only way you can go is up and the only one you can reach to is God. Down as far as they can go. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. You know anybody like that? You know anybody that right now, while I preach, is in a desperate place? Somebody that is in one of the worst places that a man or woman can be in. Somebody say, God help this morning. You see, no matter how far in that prison you and I have gone, I want to show you a few things that you and I can learn from their story. First of all, as a child of God or a sinner, you can still cry out and call out to God. Where the prison guard won't listen to me. Those around me keep telling me to be quiet. I've seen a lot of folks in prison and they're down in a prison and think everybody around them is their best friend. They're all hanging out in prison together, feeding off of each other, basically, spiritually speaking. But I can tell you this much. Bound people can't give bound people freedom. You hear what I'm saying? You yoke yourself together with other people that are just like you. And I'm going to tell you, whenever I've watched somebody backslide, the Lord has a reason why I'm preaching this. I've watched people when they backslide. They pull away from the church. They pull away from Christian people. They draw away. You try to call them. They don't answer your call. They start blocking you on Facebook, deleting you off of friendship, social media. They'll, if you try to text them, they won't answer your text. If they do, they're short with you. They don't want anything to do with God's people. Then the devil gets on their shoulder and starts trying to make them believe that the real problem is the church people and how they've done, and then they find fault. That's just the way the enemy works. I've seen it over and over and over again. Say amen, somebody. But you see, no matter how many people you surround yourself that are just like you, because that's what they begin to do. I've watched them do it. As they begin to, now this is just a symbolic, if you will, but as they begin to delete all their Christian friends off their Facebook account, before you know they start adding all these other folk that ain't saved and living like the devil doing ungodly stuff so that when they post a picture of themselves drinking on a vodka in a bar room somewhere that somebody else can like that post and say, oh, I think that's great. Well, you look like you're having a good time because they know God's people ain't going to chime in and say, praise God for that. Uh, say amen, somebody. But you yoke yourself with other bound people. And I can tell you this, uh, they can't get up out of their stocks. Uh, they can't walk over you. They can't deliver you. Uh, that drug dealer can't deliver you. Uh, that other drug addict can't deliver you. The other alcoholics can't deliver you. Uh, I'll tell you, there ain't much more miserable than hearing two drunks sit on a curb uh, telling each other how to get free from alcohol but I can tell you this much this morning uh, he came to set the captive free and for them that are bruised to set them at liberty to open the prison of the blind uh, and I tell you this morning uh, our God came to set you free uh, I said our God came to break open the prison doors uh, to them that are in prison that have no hope that's the word of God say amen somebody oh I feel the Holy Ghost in this house but there's no limitation to how far God can go. Last night, Sister Angela, I don't know why I always say Massey because I guess I know the Massey family, but Angela Fulkerson, she said last night about how that whenever she was a little baby in that newborn uh, intensive care unit or NICU or whatever it was and how that they were way out and they, 
and the assembly of God preacher, you heard the story. It's got talking about how that he said, you know, we may not be able to go back there where that baby is, but we can pray from right here. I want you to know something, folks. Just like she said last night, I'm going to tell you right here this morning. There's no wall too thick for God. Come on, somebody hear me. There's no distance too far for God. You may not be able to help them right now by doing anything more than prayer. They won't listen to you. You tried to talk to them till you blew in the face. Or maybe it's you this morning. Uh, no matter how much, uh, but my God will walk the ocean deep uh, and the ocean wide uh, to get to where they're at. Uh, I can tell you there have been a many a night. Uh, amen, Sister Tracy. I can tell you I prayed uh, until my eyes were swollen uh, and my face was swollen uh, and I left snot everywhere for people just like you in the late night hour. And I tell you the reason why is because I know uh, that if the devil gets a clutch or a grip, uh, he don't want to let go. Uh, but through prayer, I can't convince everybody. But I know somebody they care. It's the Holy Ghost conviction. He can break chains. Uh, he can go where I can't go. Oh, come on, somebody. I can't always be right where they're at. Some of them won't let me go there. Some of them won't even listen to me. I've got some who prayed around the altars. I've got videos of them shouting while I was preaching, hollering, come on, pastor, helping me in illustrations that have blocked me, deleted me, and every bit tried to forget me because they want to silence the voice of the help on the ends of the outside. Say amen, somebody. You might be listening this morning. You try to silence the voice of anybody that's tried to help. And you try to make everybody else the problem but you. Come on, that self-centered thing inside of you that makes it all about everybody's the problem. Uh, you always got the answer and nobody knows as much as you. That's called self-righteousness uh, and being self-centered. That is a product of the spirit and power of that inner prison where you've been at for a long time. Say amen. You've heard the story before of the eagles in captivity. I'm going to share this with you. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Somebody told a story one time of me raising rabbits. I can see this. And they said that in this particular zoo, they have the American eagle, the bald eagle, in a facility there where all the habitation is made like and unto the ideal habitation for an eagle. It's not a real big place. It's still confined. The eagle can only fly so high. And they said that in that place, they have to constantly dress up and maintain, try to make this eagle look its absolute best. But if you ever saw pictures of it versus an eagle that is out in the wild, you would quickly understand there's something's not right. The eagle looks scattered. His feathers are not right. His, his, his uh, form and everything is not right. But they said that one day that an eagle got injured and somebody had brought it, transported it. I think it was wildlife services transported it to this zoo where they had this habitation. So they took this wild eagle that was injured and they put it in that habitation. And they said, for the longest time, that eagle would absolutely go bananas trying to get out of there. Here it was injured, and it would try to fly as hard as it could one direction, and it would go, hit the net and fall down on the ground, and it would try and fly again and hit the net and fall down. And everybody's standing around. Well, they're looking, and they're trying to understand, why is this eagle... Come on now. I'm going to preach to you. Why is this eagle here? He's going bananas. He's bouncing off the walls and everything else. He just seems like he is so unhappy. While that other eagle is just sitting over there. He's on the perch. He's just hanging out. Waiting on somebody to throw some tree through the, through the window. Whatever. Why is that? 
Well, one day some passers by and they began to look and somebody asked that question to that person that was giving them the tour through and the tour guide stopped and looked and said, that one that's perched and standing still, he's been in captivity so long, he's got used to it and he doesn't desire any freedom because this is all he's ever known. He's been raised since an eagle in that captivity and I tell you, you bring somebody that knows what freedom is uh, and you bring them into that place uh, they're going to go bananas and say this ain't what's for me I know what freedom feels like uh, you take a backslider who's been in a place of freedom they've shouted the glory now they've been filled with the Holy Ghost uh, and you put them in captivity they're going to begin to go bananas after a while First, it don't feel right. I don't know why I'm preaching like this. I didn't plan on saying all this. At first, it don't feel right. There's a reluctancy. I won't go that far. Well, I'll only do this. I'll just smoke a cigarette. I won't do a whole pack. I won't, I'll just smoke one joint. That's all. I'll stop with that. I just one snort of cocaine. I won't get addicted. You know, the longer they're in that captivity, the more they get used to it. And they begin to lose touch with reality of what it really is like. I'm going to tell you this morning. For those that you've seen that a backslide slid on the Lord and you look at their life and you think... I just can't believe it. Bless God. Don't they know what they're missing? They know better. They were raised in it. They've seen it and all these other things. Yes, they might have been. And they may vaguely still remember certain things. And there may be times that the Spirit of God brings it back to their mind. But I can tell you what's happened with some uh, is they've been down there and stalked so long. Their arms have got used to being in that position. Their legs have got accustomed to be in this tender. And if you were to set them free, they wouldn't know what to do with themselves. They have been there so long. And I tell somebody here this morning, uh, instead of standing around and doing the little holy dance uh, on those that are in the inner prison, uh, why don't we rise up and be the answer and stop being the problem? Uh, say amen, somebody. I just feel like this morning, the love of God Shining through you is the only hope. Pastor, I've done it a hundred times and it still ain't worked. Well, what is the alternative? Give up? What kind of message would that send? Say amen, somebody. I know people right now. I know people right now that have told me if I would have only known, I would have listened. I would have paid attention. The other day, Sister Myers and I were watching something, and I don't know if she remembers this. A documentary. And in this documentary, a man's wife committed suicide. Took her life. Tragic thing. The brother made the statement. He said, I wish that I would have seen the signs. Just whether coincidentally or not, a few days later, we saw something very similar to that. And in what we saw, this brother had a sister who had tried to reach out to him. But he said, I've got this thing and this thing and this to do. I'll get with you a little later. And his sister took her life and he ended up with her child. And as he sat with tears and regret, he said, if I would have just known if I would have just took a little time to realize. You see, why are you saying that, Brother Myers? 
Because what you don't understand, and God only knows why in the world I'm preaching this this morning. I had no intention to go in this direction. God only knows where that that person is at right now. And sometimes the only people they have that are there that will care and love them or, you know, try to pray for them. It might be you. It might be me. They might be the only hope. And if you say, I've had enough, and you say, well, I quit, forget it. Honey, I know sometimes you got to use tough love. I know sometimes you got to quit patting the, their pamper and you got to back off and let them become an adult. Sometimes you got to back up and let people realize how much they need God. I understand that. Uh, but don't you ever get to the place uh, that they have to lay down at night and wonder, do they still love me? Uh, say man, somebody. You know, years ago I heard a story and I, I'm going to tell you this because I feel it's appropriate. But they said a little boy had got in trouble with his mom and his dad. And that little boy had kept getting in trouble. He was running home late every night uh, from school and getting bad grades. Uh, and his daddy told him, he said, the next time you come in late for supper, he said, you'll sit there in an empty plate and you won't get anything to eat. Uh, well, one night that little boy came in late again. Uh, and when he came in, the family was already sitting down to their five course meal. Sweet tea on the table, a plate full of mashed potatoes and everything else. Uh, mama had spread the table, looked so beautiful. Well, whenever dad did the traditional thing and dad said, let's all bow our head and pray and ask grace. Uh, they bowed their head to ask grace. Uh, dad reached over and took that boy's empty plate and switched it and gave him his plate. When he opened his eyes, uh, he said, son, tonight, uh, he said, I'll take your empty plate, but don't let this happen again. Yeah, sometimes they just need to know that you're willing to go the extra mile with them to know that you're willing to suffer. You're willing to sacrifice with them. I've told you many years ago about one family member. I, don't, I really don't know why the Lord directed me this way. I just, somebody must need this. That's all I know. Some of you heard me tell this, but we had a family member who was bulimic and would stick her finger down her throat, make herself throw up. She was underneath the pressure the young girls go through with photoshopped images through the internet and magazines and every there's a lot of shaming that goes on in our culture expectations these young girls will live up to. And here she was, as far as I was concerned, she looked like a bean rail, and she was worried she was too too heavy. So she was doing what they call burging, uh, binging and purging, and I, I didn't know anything about it. And some of you heard me tell this, but I'm going to tell, tell it again. I didn't know much about it, and my first reaction was just quit sticking your finger down your throat. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. My attitude was a lot like that gentleman that I've seen at that supply house. Just stop sticking your finger down your throat. That's all you just stop doing that and be a whole lot better. You know, that's all you got to do. And you know, I, I, I didn't understand it because I'd never dealt with anything like this. But as a pastor, I have an obligation to show mercy and compassion and understand what I'm up against when I pray and I try to help those that we love. And uh, so I got on the internet at that time. This was way back, you know, probably 2004, 2005. And I got studying about it and I found a lot of stuff I didn't understand. I didn't know how addictive that it actually was. And there was a whole lot more than just not, not sticking your finger down your throat. They even said that after that's been done so much and after so long a period of time that the body starts automatically doing it without you even having to do that. Some of them can just do a certain thing and make themselves vomit. And they would go in and they would eat all kinds of food uh, and they would gorge themselves out and then go in the other room and puke it all out in hopes that it wouldn't affect them and their weight. Uh, amen. It was destroying their esophagus. It was rotting out their teeth. Uh, but all of this and many I tried to stop but just couldn't do it. Amen. There were so many and I didn't realize how many were addicted to that and were doing that. Well I remember I've told you this before but there was a camp meeting coming up and it was you know most of you that knows 
Sister Myers and I, you know that my birthday is October the 15th. Hers is the 13th. Our anniversary is on the 16th. Everything all in one week. And we had already planned. There was a camp meeting and that's the kind of folk we are. We weren't going to here or there. We were going to go to church during our, our week, you know, enjoy the house of God. There's a powerful camp meeting in South Florida. Well, we had already planned. That's what we were going to do. And uh, I had some others that were going to try and go. They were going to stay in another room. Well, during that week, uh, that sister, we were trying to help. We were pastoring at the time just a little bit in church. Uh, and uh, she told my wife she was going to get help. Uh, she had already gone through a program uh, and that didn't help her. Well, she had came home uh, and she was such a mess. Uh, and Sister Myers said, hey, amen, she was in such a bad shape. She said, I'll stay with you if that's what it means to you. I'll stay with you. I'll show you. I'll get you know, go for the long haul with you. It was our anniversary. It was our birthdays. Uh, but instead, uh, that woman of God stayed home the whole week uh, trying to make sure that girl didn't relapse. Uh, laid on the couch beside her. Prayed for her the whole time. And I'll tell you the reason why. It's because sometimes uh, you got to get a hold of a man or woman of God who believes uh, and they practice what they preach. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. My Lord, I hope this helps somebody. Amen. But we can also learn this morning from this story of the limitations. There are none that God has to hear. No limitation that God has to reach. And no limitation God has to go wherever they are, wherever you are. I want to ask you a question this morning. I want you to think about this. How many of you that are here this morning were once in an inner prison that you're a product of the deliverance of God. Raise your hand. Anybody here that was down deep in things, you've done things you wouldn't want plastered on this wall. I'll tell you something, folks. Now, we can flower it up, make it sound pretty. We can sit around. Yeah, I beat so-and-so up. I'm about 10 years old. I might beat his head off. Back when I was a sinner, he used to beat everybody up. That's a whole other thing. We'll preach about that another day. Yeah, when I was about 11 years old, I went to the store and I stole some bubble gum. There are some stories people don't tell. Y'all are awful quiet. There are some things they ain't going to tell you. It ain't because they have to. It's because... Most everybody knows, no matter how much you tell somebody you've been delivered, you don't want them looking at you like that. You don't want them thinking about that every time they see you. I knew one pastor and his wife. We had sat down one day. They bawled, squalled in tears. And they said, God's done so much. But there's a lot of our testimony that we can't tell. The average person, they went into telling me how that before that they were in the military. And how that in one place they were stationed at. That they used to be, you know, I don't know how to say it, swingers or whatever. And there were other people in the military. And at late out in hours of the night, one would leave this house. They'd go across and they'd be with each other. And it said, now, here he is he's a preacher of the gospel and he said when I think back to the things that I did uh, he said I wondered am I said, how in the world could I ever get down to that place let me tell you some folk uh, hey man our past may not be pretty but sometimes folk need to understand I wasn't on the outside of the prison I wasn't in the first quarter of the prison you're looking at somebody whenever I cried out God had to hear me from the basement of the prison God had to hear me in the stench and the quagmire of where I was at his mercy had to go a whole lot farther I've known families and if you knew things about them what they've done where they've been you might raise your eyebrow I went into one jail preaching 33rd street I had another seasoned preacher been preaching years he helped me go in there and we preached the word. Well, he, one night he said, now tonight, I'm going to let you preach. Boy, I'm going to tell you folks, whenever God first called me to preach, I was like a chainsaw wide open with the throttle stuck. 
I didn't hardly have a lot to say, I don't guess, but I was saying as fast as I could say it and preaching as hard as I could preach. And I went in there that night and I got to preaching about Jeremiah in the 18th chapter there where the potter and the clay. And that happened to be one of my absolute favorite stories. And I mean to tell you, there's brethren in that church. It was mostly all black men that were in there that night. And I want to say we probably had about 25 men in that particular service. We didn't usually have real large crowds, but they would bring us into this place of the jail. And they would lock the door and lock us in there with these men. And uh, I'd go in there and I'd play my little guitar. And sometimes them black brothers, they get to snicker and say, I like black gospel. I can't sing it. I just sound like a hillbilly from Kentucky somewhere. And so some of them would be snickering. Sometimes I'd be singing, I saw the light. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember that night, though, they were standing up. They was crying. And uh, I got to telling my testimony. Most of you know that I almost joined the KKK. Well, I wasn't. I just told them. You know, I told them what I'd been through, what I'd done, and uh, how God delivered me and everything else. And uh, that night, boy, there was one brother that left that night with plastic tables like we have in the fellowship hall. And that fella got up, and he had left a puddle of tears. i never forget it, by the grace of God, like that in the middle of that table where the, he had sat down and buried his head on that table and cried because his mama had raised him in church and had messed up and got himself there. But that, after that service, that preacher pulled me aside and he said, now, um, Brother Joe, now I don't know how to, I really don't know how to tell you this and I don't want you to take this the wrong way. He said, but in the future, if we ever go in a place like that, can you not tell people about how you used to almost join the KKK? And, uh, <laughs> And I, I, looked, I said, well, that's part of my testimony. He said, well, yeah, but there's some things that might not be the best when you locked in a prison with everybody because not everybody's saved and set free and sanctified and somebody might, you know, decide to go crazy on us. So if you could just leave that part out next time, I'm sure God will understand. You know why I said that? Because not everybody understands. That's why we don't tell how that we were in the enterprise. I was in prison. Yeah, I was down at the clean one. <laughs> I'm down there where that we weren't that bad. Well, just get real with yourself. Man, you cussed everybody out. You said things you shouldn't have said. You talked nasty. You did stuff. You, come on, somebody. There's some of you sitting here. If you'd have grew up in the era of texting, you'd have been texting stuff you shouldn't have been texting. You'd have been talking about stuff on the phone. You shouldn't have been. Come on now. Hey, man, don't sit here and look at me like you had it all together. Maybe you did. But most folks, uh, there's a lot more skeletons in the closet than they like to believe. He was down deep in a prison, but my God came by and he brought you deliverance. I want to tell you this morning, your testimony and mine brings hope to other people. And I want to share something with you and I want you to look at me. You know what I think some of our problem is after we've been saved for a long time? I think sometimes we really forget where we were when God picked us up. I've met people before that would sit and scold, make fun. Well, they don't know how to budget their bills. They waste more money than anybody ever. But you forget when you first got married, you was the biggest waste for spending. You owed everybody in town. Come on, somebody. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Well, she got another boyfriend. Well, you didn't tell everybody you cheated on your husband four times when you first got married, and nobody knows about that. Now, will not you just, anybody hear what I'm saying? Is there anybody besides me say, Pastor Myers, I'm going to be real with you and be real with God? I've done some crazy stuff. I've done some things that I'm flat out embarrassed of, and I'll never tell anybody because it's just that bad. But this morning... I brought that to your attention because you need to understand where you were when God brought you out. You need to remember some of the foolish stuff when you look at that person and how dare they. How you know? I've been there. Sometimes I get so upset and sometimes my brokenness turns into frustration. Am I the only one? Sometimes my brokenness turns into irrational thinking and I get so irritated. Why don't they serve God? Why this and why that? You know what, folks? All the wise ain't going to get nobody saved and all the wise ain't going to benefit you and me. I'll tell you what will is that you just keep on trying. Said, I've got up to bat 150 times. Honey, 
You keep swinging it at the ball. That one pastor came to me a few years ago. He said, Pastor, things have been going downhill in our church and I just don't know what to do. I said, Brother, let me tell you. I said, just like a man when he gets up to bat. I said, you swing and you miss. You swing and you miss. You swing and hit a foul ball. And before you know it, you're back in the dugout. I said, you may do that time and time and time again. I said, but like a preacher told me years ago, he said, in the church, we're going to go through good times. We're going to go through high times and low times. He said, but I've learned as a pastor, he said, if we come in the church and the Holy Ghost don't move in our testimony or prayer, he said, then we're going to move on to the singer. He said, if the Holy Ghost don't move in the singer, he said, we'll move to the offer. If the Holy Ghost don't move in that, he said, we'll move to the preacher. He said, if the Holy Ghost don't move in that, he said, we'll move to the altar service. And if we walk out that day and the Holy Ghost didn't really move, he said, we're coming back next service and we're doing it all over again. Because you and I have got to have a never quit determined mind about us. I I sometimes allude to this because I know certain people can identify with certain things the same way I have with Brother Eric or Sister Nora. Other people's been through stuff. But Brother Farmer, am I telling the truth when I tell you that in the Marine Corps, commitment and steady to the task is some of the most important things they sow into you. I mean, you are so committed and determined, sold out to the task. Can I tell you? You could be a spiritual type Marine. And I want to ask you, have you been as determined and committed to the task that is at hand? I'm going to be honest with you. It was about maybe a year ago or so, I finally had had enough. I mean, I had got to my wits end and I didn't know what else to do. I was tired of seeing the way the devil was doing this and that and the other. And I got down, Sister Tracy, and I got serious. And man, I started praying. I fasted. I sought God. And I bombarded God every chance I got about a particular person being saved. Less than a month later, they were back in church. I would venture to say a near impossibility. Are they still in church? Mm -mm. You wish they were? Yeah. But if God did it before, when you lose your vision, you're in trouble. Sister Farmer, we got to be able to still see our boy up on the drums. Man, just pounding away. Glory of God falling. We got to be able to see our daughter on her feet with her hands raised and tears running down her face, worshiping God. You got to be able to embrace that in your heart and in your mind. You know what I'm saying this morning? You got to be able to get back to that. Sister Miranda, you don't have to look at old pictures uh, and let your little heart be broken about how good it might have been in years gone by. Frame this in your mind. I see a head in time. Do you know in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 in the faith chapter, it said uh, that those heroes of faith, uh, that they looked ahead in time and they seen the promises. Uh, amen. And I'll tell you what they did. Uh, amen. They, they, they uh, brought down kingdoms uh, and they stopped the mouths of lions. Why? Because God gave them a vision of something down the road and they fought for it and they worked for it and they prayed for it and they labored for it. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you're backslid, you need deliverance, I don't know any better place than to find yourself on your knees before God. And if you're like a lot of the other folks I'm preaching to, you got family. And things is a mess right now, even as I speak. I am so tired of the wiles of the devil. 
But instead of letting it drive you to defeat. You, it's all right to get angry at the devil. There's a song that they sing at some of the youth camps. And I've heard them sing it on the radio and stuff. And it says, devil, this means war. I said, pastor, you can't go to war with the devil. What? With the Lord on my side, I ain't got to really do much of anything. Just stay committed to the fight and let it in his hands and stay committed that I'm not going to quit. You might need to call one of your loved ones and let them know just as a reminder. If there was any doubt in your mind, if I still loved you, I do. And if there was any doubt in your mind that I'm still praying for you, I do. If there's any doubt in your mind that mom and daddy's here for you, your aunt so and so's here for you. If there's any doubt in your mind, I'm still right there with you. You may not be able to feel my touch. You may not always hear my voice. But you can guarantee this, that mom and daddy, your aunt, your uncle, your brother's going to still be praying for you. You might run hard the other way, Jonah, but there'll be somebody praying God will get you back to Nineveh one way or the other. Is anybody hear what I'm saying? If it takes a whale, God will send a whale. If it takes somebody committed, he'll send somebody with a determination that says, I've got a never quit attitude. It wasn't very long ago, Sister Miranda. Right up and around here, I had a sister that we had prayed for. She's been in church. She's been out of church. And she's been out more than she's been in. And God knows I'm telling the truth what I'm saying right here. I love her. I, as a pastor, I love her soul. Sometimes God puts people in your life and it's almost like your own children when you're a pastor. Not, not, in, not in the, you understand. But I stood right up around here. You search through the videos and the sermons, you'll probably find it. I brought her up here. We all preached and rejoiced about how she was out. And we prayed for her. And I made the story and told everyone how that we went to a pastor's, pastor appreciation, who had been at a church, I think, 40 years and there was a brother that had been in the church way back when she had started. 21 or 22 years later, this pastor was still at this church, still pastoring. When this man finally decided he had had enough of the world of sin, that he was coming back to church. And guess where he came back? He came back right where he was at before. And the pastor that was there when he left was still there. And I remember looking at Sister Myers during that little thing. And I, I grabbed a hold of her hand. I said, you know who that reminds me and makes me think of? And I said this person's name. And I made the statement to her. I said, I hope to God I can be the kind of pastor that if one walks out and decides I ain't coming back. And not a 21 years later, 10, 15 years later, when they finally decide I want more of God. That me and Sister Myers are still steady on the track. Still worshiping. Still being faithful still be in the real deal because you know what people can have confidence and say when I fell by the wayside uh, they kept on going uh, and if for no other reason they loved me through it all I'll be by their side because they were by my side come on somebody you're leaving a legacy for somebody every time you get up Sister Myers used to get up and go to church uh, leave me at the house when I was lost uh, she'd ask me you want to go to church I'd say no she came home from church uh, she'd look me in the face and say uh, what'd you do and all this was it alright I was great I wanted her to think everything was great but I sat there in that empty house and was miserable the whole time let me tell you there's a lot of stuff they may not tell you there may be conviction God puts on them you don't know about but you trust God somehow God is going to bring your prayers to pass stand to your feet all across the house before I preach into an oblivion this morning Amen. What is a pastor to do whenever he has a burden this size but to preach like this? I don't even know how in the world I could have a burden like this and just try to get up to you and read to you like a you know, library teacher. I just couldn't do it because my heart is so swollen with pain, frustration, anger towards the devil and sin. 
But Lord, please help me through all of this. Not to get so aggravated and upset that I lose the edge and my inroad to make a difference. God, help me not lose that. Sister Tracy, do I practice what I preach? Sister Myers, and I love you, Sister, more than you'll ever know. And there's some of you here, you know what I'm saying. You see, God's going to open up doors and allow you to do everything for others that God allowed others to do for you. And you see, sometimes, just like it was for them, the Bible said, in every man's bands were loosed from his hands. Sometimes what it takes is to be in an atmosphere, to be around people, to be in a service. Whether that deliverance comes and it's able to be like a rock in a pond when you throw it in, it just continues to make waves in the pond. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning. Sister Farmer, Brother Farmer, if you'll come this morning, play something for me. I want every head bowed, every eyes closed this morning as we give an altar call. I've preached to you with every fiber of my soul about this inner prison. You see, this inner prison that the two men of God were in, it was a physical one by nature. But the greatest prison I've ever preached to or about is the prison of the mind and heart. How many people have we seen and known battled in that mental prison? And sometimes our efforts feel like a rock in a pond. Am I really making a difference? I've been there. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. You know what? I can't do anything about yesterday's undone task. But repent. But this is what I can do. I can make a commitment before God and a decision right now. God, I've got some people that are in stocks this morning that I beg of you to get them out of them stocks. They're in a filthy, dark place. The rodents of sin and the traces of ungodliness are all over their life.